both my husband and my son were two men that you would never in a million years suspect that they would take their life. What gives you a ticket to the other side? Do not be afraid to ask that question. And those comfort zones, they shrink in on us. Friends, today I actually have a friend on the podcast today named Carrie Conley. We met at a speaking engagement training thing um, months ago. Her story fascinated me, and so I asked her to be on the podcast. She said yes, so today we get to hear her story. Carrie, thanks for joining us. No, oh, Jen, it's so interesting that you say that my story fascinates you. When I heard your story, all I could do is look at you and go, really? <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing the punk show right now, right? Like, is it someone punking me right now and just saying, gotcha? I'm looking around the room going, is she for real? <laughs> is everybody watching this? Is this person right. like a master BSer? Because this is good BSing. Oh, I love it. But man, your story touched my heart. And it started about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So bring us there, if you yeah. can. So I have been um, unofficially, Jen, for about 12 years, a speaker on vision. And then officially I launched into doing this 10 years ago. And my topic has always been on the top, the importance of having a very clear, powerful written vision for your life, because most people have what I call a winging it plan, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of drifting through life, you know, taking it one day at a time. And, you know, for some people that works, but for a lot of the people that I was working with as a coach, it wasn't working at all. And so I was speaking on it. I was coaching people on it, um, was, you know, it was taking off. And at that time, my husband and I had become empty nesters and our, my son had just graduated from college and my daughter was going into her junior year. And the year that it officially really all took off, uh, August of 2014, my husband, uh, died by suicide and got through that. And then three years later, uh, my 25 year old son also died by suicide. And so my daughter and I, um, who is now 30 and married and has two little boys, uh, we started speaking together and we launched a book together called keep looking up. So, so I now, um, talk a lot about my story, what happened, um, how vision helps me get through it, you know, all, all the things. Okay. So let's go back to that, yeah. which, um, if I'm being invasive of all, let me know, no, but you're August, great. 2014, like, did you have signs now that yeah. you look back on things? Was there things that you guys were working through? Was it totally mm -hmm. blindside? How did that show up? Yeah. There's so much to that, you know, cause everybody wants to know what right. were the signs? Did you see it coming? Did you suspect it? You know, as everything in life, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah. Like me on the other side of this now twice, I can look back and see bigger signs that I didn't identify at the moment. But at that time, Jen, you have to know that both my husband and my son were two men that you would never in a million years suspect that they would take their life. My husband was very, very successful, very outgoing, very well respected and loved. Um, and he just was going through a period in his life. I think, you know, when we became empty nesters, um, there was a lot of stress on the marriage, uh, which okay. had been that way for a while. Okay. Uh, also was going through a lot of stress with his job. He was with the same company very successfully, Jen, for about 25 years. But the, the year and a half leading up to before he died, his company was going through a merger. And like, unfortunately, most men, and I hate to generalize, but I think this is true. They are so attached. What they do is so attached to their identity. Mm -hmm. And I think he was very, very worried that things were going to shift big time for him in his role. Um, I think there was a lot of other things playing into that. I mean, I, I've been with my husband since I was in high school. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, we started dating the end of my junior year and his senior year. Went through college together, all the things. And not knowing what I know now, I think there was a lot in his upbringing that I didn't know about mm -hmm. that I, I think was starting to play out for him at that phase of in his life. So yes, I knew he was struggling through some things, but did I ever think that he would take his life? No. Yeah. That's a different level for sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
um, how but they say it's is it somewhat genetic at mm. some level too from that like just depression or having a harder time like doing that kind of stuff is do they link any of that or did you have any signs differently from your son since it was so close mm. after your husband I mean, he wasn't living with you, right? So that changes things too, because how much are you knowing on a day-to-day basis? With my son? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me answer your question about genetics. I've also, I, I obviously have done a lot of mm-hmm. inner work on this and a lot of asking questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not a big believer that genetics plays a major part in any kind of disease. Okay. Um. I think it has a lot to do with the stories that the trauma that is embedded in your body from childhood that is not dealt with. And I think that two people with the same genetics can deal with something completely in two totally different ways. Um, so I think there's a lot of that. I think with my son, um, he actually was living with me for a couple of years. So after his dad passed, I got him to remember, I was telling you that he's, he had just been offered a job at a college to move to. So I moved him to Arizona, got him there. And he actually lived with me for a couple of years because I moved there as well. And then he finally did move out on his own, bought his condo and all the things. I think for my son, it was a lot of how he did not process things outwardly. Okay. Um, I think there was a lot of, again, for men, it's a lot of pride to admit how, how, dark things are getting really. Um, and even as close as we were, Jen, we were very, very close. And I was with him a lot, especially the last two weeks, um, before he passed. Um, I still did not understand the depth of what he was thinking. Um, I do think, however, that if his dad had not passed by suicide, I don't think he would have either. Okay. Um, I don't think he would have thought of that as an option. I don't know. You know, it's I can't, it's hard for somebody on this side. Yeah. I don't, you don't know what's going on in their minds. Nobody does. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just yeah, a very, very dark place that they get to that. They literally at that moment are not in their right mind. Right. Obviously. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's been quite the journey and <laughs> Um, like I said, my daughter at that point, after my son passed, she got engaged, uh, and that was a part of the plan before my son even passed. And then the following year got married the following year she had her first baby. Now she has two little boys. Um, and she and I have done a lot of work together on this, mm-hmm. um, in some ways the same in a lot of ways differently. Okay. And so we've had to learn, we've learned a lot about the topic and about how and what has helped each of us get through it, which we talk a lot about in our book. Yeah. Keeping your, keeping your head up. up. Yeah. Looking up. Um, how has that book helped you? Cause I, I actually have interviewed people that help people write books yes. that have gone through trauma and yes. not all of them are like designed to be published, right? They're just designed right. as a way to process what happened and look at the story and rewrite the story and like, you know, yeah. make it so they're not a victim. How yes. has this process helped you? Yeah. So when we decided to write the book, so we wrote the book a year and a half after my son passed. Um, so to answer your question about what was that process like? So my daughter and I decided a year and a half after my son passed to write the book. And the biggest reason we decided to write the book, not was to, we didn't want to write the story just to get a lot of sympathy and, you know, attention. We wrote the book because we learned so much in the journey and so many people were coming to us, asking us, uh, how are you getting through this? What helped you get through this? I had a lot of people, both of us had a lot of people come to us saying, Hey, I'm trying to help a friend work through something right now, and I don't know what to do to help them. So the biggest reason we wrote the book was a tool that we could give people. Mm -hmm. So um, it's 11 chapters of which we address something that we've learned in the process. And then I talk about my perspective. My daughter, Laurel, talks about her perspective. And then there are questions at the end that you can ask yourself. Um, 
So yeah, it, it really was quite a process. We hired a ghostwriter. Okay. So we would meet with the ghostwriter every week or every other week, and we would talk out the chapter to her, and then she would write it, we would edit it, and then we'd move on to the next one. So it was very, it was almost like therapy because we had to talk through everything. So, you know, but the thing is, is that it gets easier. Like you and I as speakers, every time we tell our story, it gets a little bit easier, a little bit easier. What's the hardest part of telling the story right now for you? I think it's uh, the emotion around, you know, so many young adults right now, mm -hmm. um, just struggling mm -hmm. and it just breaks my heart. Yeah. So a young adult or a mom's listening and her son's struggling right now. Like mm -hmm. what is the first piece of advice that you'd give somebody? Mm -hmm. So there's a myth and I believed this for the longest time that if you ask somebody, if they're thinking about taking their life, that you're planting a seed. And that is so not true. So I'm going to tell you right now, do not be afraid to ask that question. Yeah. Um, and do not, as, you know, it's just so hard because again, Jen, we all know people who are dealing with stuff, right? We all are dealing with life. We just don't and know we how don't deep. Have, what's that? Is that, yeah, we just don't know how deep, right? Like we only, we don't understand how deep it is for them. And so, you know, if you have a friend that's, I don't know, struggling with their marriage or struggling with a kid that's, you know, rebellious right now, or they're, what they're health or whatever, we don't immediately assume, immediately assume somebody's suicidal, right. right? We just think, oh, they're going through a rough patch, um, you know, but I think now more than ever, we have to pay attention is, is this, has this gone on for a while? Mm -hmm. I saw a really interesting fact the other day of if this is just where it's been a bad day or two, that's one thing. If it's something where this has been going on for quite a while, and there's any change in their personality or their behavior, especially if they withdraw, um, you know, I would start asking questions mm -hmm. and get them to somebody that they can talk to sooner than later. Didn't do either of those things with my husband or my son. Um, and yeah. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. it was just probably so out of the realm of possibility. How has having a vision that you talk about mm -hmm. helped you with processing these tragedies? Yeah. So I've had a vision way before all this happened. Okay. Um, I, wrote, I wrote my first vision when I was 28. So this was the late eighties, Jen. <laughs> so, Ooh, ahead of the time. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> uh, and I wrote it because I had a mentor who said, you're never going to be satisfied with this nine to five gig. I was jumping jobs like every two years. Uh, and she was the first person who said to me, you can create your life to look like however you want it to be. You just have to get super clear on what that is. And so I took a day off of work and with a legal pad of paper, a little journal, I wrote out in detail what I wanted to, my life to look like, uh, how I wanted to be living, how much money I wanted to be making, what kind of mom I wanted to be when we were starting our family, you know, what kind of person I wanted to be, um, lot pages. I still have it all. That's awesome. Um, That's yeah. amazing. What's changed the most over the years that you look back on that? Well, what's changed, obviously, is my lifestyle. I thought, you know, that my husband and I would be, you know, doing the great empty nester thing right now, possibly doing a business together. Um, obviously, that all shifted. The vision hasn't the vision hasn't changed, but the mission has. Okay. So the reason I was teaching people all these years about having a really clear vision, Jen, when I was networking and I was coaching, was that I was co coaching mostly. Uh, female service-based entrepreneurs that weren't making money in their business because they didn't have a clear vision. So the reason I would do my vision work was because I was bringing in clients into a coaching program. Yep. So I still teach the same vision process, but the reason I teach it now is on a much bigger mission. And the bigger mission is to give people hope in a very dark world. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because without hope, people perish. And there are a lot of people, again, especially the young adult in uh, age group that I have my heart set on, they'll be the first to tell you, not only do they not see a three-year vision for their life, which is what I ask people to write out, is what do you see three years from now? They have no idea what the next three months really looks like. 
um, very stressed about their life. I interview a lot of them, Jen, and they all tell me the same thing. They feel very, very stressed about their life. A lot of pressure. And is that pressure to like pay bills? Is that pressure? What's, what's that pressure? Definitely a lot of, a lot around money, money, uh, a lot around money. How are they going to make money? How are they going to get by on the money they're making? How are they going to get out of debt? Because a lot of them are coming out of college with insurmountable debt. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, cost of living right now, depending on where they live, is very stressful. I'm from Denver, and right now, I think, you know, in order for them to survive, you're, you've got to have like four roommates. You know, it's just um, a lot of pressure to succeed. Um, social media has a lot to do with that. A lot of pressure, I think, from their schools, from their parents. Um, they're just coming into a world that I don't remember it being like that when I came out of college in 1984, feeling all of that pressure. Um, and on top of that, which is kind of a, a thing now, is they're also dealing with grief because there has been so much suicide already in their generation and sickness that they've lost people at a very early age. Right. So that is kind of a unique thing for this generation because we didn't have that. I don't know if you did, but we certainly didn't. No, I remember looking back and we had car accidents. Mm -hmm. I remember one month we had four car accidents. Like mm -hmm. every weekend someone died in an accident. Mm -hmm. And now I have a son that's 16 or 17. Yeah. So I just remember being like, okay, now listen, like we, you know, it just makes you more hyper vigilant on whatever yeah. that thing is. But well, I would imagine in a, because of your car accident as well, Jen. Yeah. 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 Cars and yeah. me like, ah, you want to yeah. trigger refrigerator. Yep. Yep. Um, so somebody that's listening today that is feeling this external pressure that they might have internalized. So now it's yeah. not only coming from the external, it's coming from the internal. Yes. What are the first few things they can do to start getting in the driver's seat? Okay. Of their thoughts? So I'll give you the three-step process that I walk people through when I write a vision because I think it'll answer your question. Okay. The first thing I do is get them to understand why... My tagline and the, and the title of my first book that I wrote is called Vision is Victory. And I go through points of me talking about when you have a clear vision, how much it fixes in your life. Mm -hmm. And so you need to become aware of, you know, if you're struggling with, and the list is long, uh, so I won't list them all, but any kind of, you feel like you're drifting, you're not feeling fulfilled, you can't get your time under control, you're hanging with the wrong people, uh, you know, Again, the list is really long. When you have a really clear vision, you will see how it one by one starts helping you fix those things, yeah, right? Right. Well, it allows you to know what to say yes to because you have something to bounce every decision off of. That's exactly, and that's point number one that I always make when I do my workshops is I tell people the first thing you're going to notice, it's going to help you put better boundaries around your time, around your money and the people you spend it with. Because it is a gauge for me. So every time I get asked to do something, and I know you're getting asked to do a lot of things too, I can easily say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Because it either lines up with where I'm going and who I am and it fits what I'm doing, or it doesn't. And a lot of times, more times than not, it's a no or it's not right now. Yeah. My, yeah. I mean, I believe in like, it's a hell yes, or it's a no. And right. along your lines of clarity equals prosperity. Yes. Because you just like, you know, we have energy, but if you like splatter it everywhere, you're not yeah. going to get anywhere. So it's more right. or less honing it in and be like, okay, here's the trail. Here's what I'm doing. Go. Right. Yeah. So that's the first thing we talk about is we build a foundation around, okay, now you understand why you need to sit down and really get clear on this. Right. Second part of the process is, um, like I mentioned earlier, I get them to think three years out. So if I get them to sit in a quiet space with a journal I get them to date it as if it's three years from that day. And then after the date, I put the, how old they will be and how old their family members will be because time and aging are non-negotiable. Right. When I get them to think three years out and think about their ages and the ages of their, especially their kids, it's like, wow, uh, there's a lot coming. And like you just talking about your 16 year old son, right? I called him 16 and he's 17. Like, right. I mean, like that's point in case. <laughs> 
There we go. Right. So you can think three years out how old he's going to be. So you can see shifts in the lifestyle coming that you want to make sure you're prepared for. And then you go to work at writing out. Okay. Think about that age and what you want your life to look like in every area of your life. Family life, faith life, friends, your fitness and health, your finances, your career, you know, everything. Right. The last thing I get them to do in this will answer your question is I want them to become aware of what they hear themselves telling themselves when they're writing the vision. Yes. Because there's the inner dialogue where you're going to get stuck. Yep. And so the first thing we have to become aware of is what are my stories that are ruling my life right now that are going to keep me from going after and creating this vision? Yeah. That's where the real work has to be done. Right. I do a 40 day challenge with people. It's yeah. like you climb Mount Everest from the comfort of your home over 40 days. It is not a physical fitness challenge, like at all. Like, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it can be a little challenging at times, but it's really, that's my mom is 70 and can do it. It is like realizing what your story is when you run out of time that day, or when you can't get the full workout in, are you going to do part of the workout or is it a, like a zero and yeah. just identifying these little things that no matter what your goal is, it's going to show up. So if I can shrink your like time frame of setting a goal to 40 days, then we can identify what that thing is and utilize that so that any goal we take on, we have the ability to overcome because we caught it. Yes. Yes. But yeah. this is the harder work because now we're talking about changing patterns that have been here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Most especially people have deep seated stories around money. I'll just use that as one example. Um, that's keeping them really, really stuck financially. Um, sometimes it's it's traumatic loss, like me. Right? I've had to really become aware of what, after all of this, now, like I told you, it's now almost been 10 years since my husband, and then it'll be seven years since my son. And I'm just now doing the deeper, deeper, deeper work on the trauma that I did not realize I had really, you know, embodied out of all this. Right. Yeah. It's hard work. It is. Yeah. It is hard work. But, but what gives you a ticket to the other side, right? Yes. Like you're going to have to go through it. And yes. Having that safe space, having somebody to work with, having that vision to anchor into, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to go. This is where I want to go. When these roadblocks yes. or obstacles come up, we have a way to navigate forward. Yep. Yeah. Yes. The the gentleman you and I are both working with, um, with our speaking careers, asked me a lot of questions today. And the biggest question he kept asking me was, what brought you through all of that? Right? And I told him what helped me get through building two businesses when I wanted to quit was that I, what I wanted for my life and my family was bigger than, than the obstacles I was facing. So it was always the vision that was pulling me through, you know, the bad days. Now it's pulling me through what I'm doing, sharing my story, um, you know, working to get on bigger stages and now hopefully starting to work with a young adult community mm -hmm. because I feel like, if I can help them understand clarity around their own life and being super intentional about it, that I'm hoping they'll raise up little humans that do the same thing. Yeah. Just intersecting that at an earlier stage. Right. Our pain becomes our purpose. Yes. Yeah. And there are days where you just, like you and I were joking before we got on here, there are days you just, I, I say this all the time, some days I just want to go be a greeter at Walmart. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Today, I can tell you, I had the car go wrong. The neighbor had to bring my kid to school. The other one had to jump the car. And it, like, I mean, it was just one of those days where I'm like, okay, this is funny. This is like, yeah. this is actually like getting comical because there's so many things going wrong. Maybe yeah. I should just go to bed and go skiing or something because this work thing is not happening. Right. Yeah. And those are the days though, that I know that I must be on the right path and about to do something really great. Yeah. Because if I wasn't, there would not be all these, these things that I have to work through and overcome to get there. Mm -hmm. I'd be in a comfort zone. 
Yeah, and those comfort zones, they shrink in on us if we don't yeah. expand them. So they're always moving. It's our position to be able to keep expanding them instead of letting them shrink our world. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you're on bigger stages. You have the two books. You like do stuff with your daughter. Your target market is young adults, um, helping them with their vision. You have the three-step process. Like, how do people find you to connect with you and to learn more and get all the goodies that you have to offer? I have a website, obviously. It's just kerryconley.com. Um, I also have my own podcast called Moving Through and Beyond, and I'm thrilled that I'm going to get to interview you soon. Yes. Uh, it's been going very well since I launched it a year and a half ago. Um, and I also have a Facebook group that we just launched to get this community up and running. It's called Vision is Victory. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I'm all over the place, social media, you know, all the things. Yeah. So find her website, pick your channel of choice, say hello, join the Vision is Victory Facebook group, and let's make a difference. Let's have a vision to carry our story forward. Yes. I like Thank it. You, Thank you, Carrie, so much for having uh, like being here today. I appreciate you.